that before you sit. Let's go around, say hi to someone. And here's a challenge. Try to say hi to someone you don't remember their name. Or never met. Okay, let's see. I, know I don't know you. <laughs> uh. No, I'm not. Now I am. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to you if it's not back. Um, this week's sermon was a, a little difficult for me to write, uh, not because I didn't understand the text or anything like that, because I could swear that I've preached on this before. So I went back through uh, the annals of time, i.e. the digital folders on my computer, and I found a message that I preached in September of 2018 on the book of 2 John, and I had forgotten I did that. Lo and behold, uh, there in that dusty tome lay the references to today's text that I had sought out, Indiana Jones style, looking for these ancient scrolls, you know, the parts where Indiana Jones is in the library at the college where he works, that kind of Indiana Jones. Um, anyway, I figure looking up my old sermons counts as research. So um, I'm also fairly certain that anyone heard me preach that um, that long ago doesn't remember it. Um, so I'm just going to regurgitate uh, those parts here and uh, do that. So let's go back to several years ago. So uh, how about those Eagles? Who would have who thought Nick Foles would win Philadelphia their first ever Super Bowl, huh? By beating the great Tom Brady. He's probably going to retire. And boy, that Foles guy looked like he's going to be great for years to come, huh? That is unless the whole world gets shut down by some strange new disease or something. But like that's going to happen. All right, um, let's stick to the biblical stuff. We'll get past all that. Um, I got an idea. How about you take out your copy of the Word and turn to 1 John chapter 2, and we'll go from there. Uh, we're going to be reading verses 7 to 11. I wanted to get through verse 12. I told people I would get through verse 12, but after I got to page 12 of my script, I realized I'd have to preach for 20 minutes longer than I usually do. Uh, to cover those verses. So I came back, rewrote this paragraph, and we're only going to verse 11. So let's read that whole thing, then we'll go back and we will look at it in detail. So 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 to 11. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So this is part of why I love John's style. I love the way John writes. Verses 7 and 8 are kind of funny if you're, you're familiar with John and his writing. He essentially repeats himself without repeating himself by contradicting himself to support himself, and I love that. 
Craig, what on earth are you talking about? Well, let's look at those two verses, 7 and 8, and then maybe you will understand. So, beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. But the old commandment is the word that you've heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And I've got some hints in there. Um, and this is what I love about deep diving. This is, this is such a rich um, passage, such a, a rich text. And, and again, you'll note I emphasize some things uh, in a couple of different ways. And we're going to go to the italicized part first. All right? So let me clarify that italicized part. John writes that he's not writing about a new command, that he's writing about an old command with which we are all quite familiar. And this old command is also a new command while remaining an old command with which we are all quite familiar. And thus, we are also all quite familiar with this new command that isn't a new command at all, but is rather an old familiar command. So I hope that cleared it up. <laughs> hey, what's the old command? Leviticus 19.19, 19. and Leviticus is pretty old. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Well, golly, I could swear I heard that somewhere else, Matthew 22, 39-40. This is the great and first commandment. And a second, that was to love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. So John isn't writing a new command because Jesus already said this new command, which wasn't a new command at all because he was quoting an old command from Leviticus. But it isn't just a quote of an old command. It actually is a new command in him. And that's next. We'll get to that. But while still maintaining the qualities of the old Levitical command. So now what does that mean? A new commandment which is true in him. Why is the old Levitical command to love new in Christ Jesus, and then also in us, followers of Christ Jesus. Well, this newness comes from a couple of places, um, all of which have to do with understanding who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, coupled with the fact that John's audience, and then we as a 21st century believers, are all familiar with who Jesus is and what he has done, whereas Old Testament believers, um, they, they were not. They had only a shadow of what, for them, was to come. Well, like, what shadows? Well, good question. We have the ultimate, and quite dramatic, honestly, new illustration of this love, of a divine, perfect love, as shown on the cross. We have Jesus' teachings on the Old Testament law. The old, you have heard it said, but I tell you passages, you can look at Matthew 5 if you want examples. There's your homework. Um, as well as descriptions of scenes of Jesus' life from the Gospels that also illustrate the old law, clarify that law that would have seemed new to Jesus' listeners. It's still the old law, but it feels new. And then we also can't forget the new experience of believers, of Christ's followers, as they grow in love and fellowship with one another and for one another, as they're changed from within by the Holy Spirit and by the character of Jesus, make them more like the character of Jesus, to make them that new creature that Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Ephesians 2.10. This newness is all around them in their experiences and in their understandings of what they've always known. Okay, now we're getting to the bread and butter. So the command isn't new, but the command is new in him that is in Christ. Because we have a new example. So back to verses 7 and 8. 
And this is where it gets really, really interesting. Not that I didn't think it was already interesting, but, but this is, mm, okay. By the way, we're still on introductory material. Wait till I get to the point, it's awesome. Um, I think 70 to 75 to 80% of my sermons are introductory material. That's just how I, I do things. It's all background information. And then I tell you to look stuff up, and so then you get some more. It's fun. Anyway, the bold face part. Bold, bold face part. That was, uh, at the same time, this is probably my favorite part. And it's the part I was talking about earlier when I said I preached on this six or seven years ago. And I'm not going to give the same sermon. I'll kind of summarize it, but um, my point's different here than it was then. Um, the hard part will be when we do Second John, because I don't want to just dust it off and then throw it back out there when you can just go online and watch it or something. Um, great thing is, I don't think the Holy Spirit would let me do that anyway. Um, so we'll see. But anyway, to my summary, applications from this text in First John. We talked last week about knowing... Um, how we love Christ and knowing that we love Christ or in Christ if we obey his commands. But then the question comes, which ones? Um, in this text, which commands are we talking about? Are we talking about the old commands or the new ones? And the simple answer to that question is yes. Um, the bold-faced words. Okay, of verse 8. Well, how can that be? How can it be both? Verse 7 says that the old command is one that they, that we, have had from the beginning. Now, this is not the first time that these words have been used in this letter. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. From the Gospel of John, same author, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He was from the beginning. He was in the beginning, both from and in. Jesus is located, if you will, in or since the beginning. He is from the beginning in John's writings. And here in 1 John 2, we're told that the commandment emanates from the beginning. And when we say beginning, we naturally think of time. And these verses from 1 John and the Gospel of John would seem to indicate that, but I submit to you that this isn't always the case or the sense. In Isaiah 41.4, the Lord is the first and is with the last. In Isaiah 48.12, he says that he is the first, but is also the last. Isaiah 44, 6 says, I am the first and I am the last. No comma before the and, even though we have the joining of two independent clauses, each with its own subject verb and predicate nominative. Essentially, we have predicate adjectives, but we seem to have a renaming of, not a modifying of, both parts of that being given equal weight because he is equally both parts. So even grammatically, we don't separate it. He is equally both parts, ready for it, at the same time. We have an Old Testament prophet talking about the God of the Old Testament, an old understanding of who God is, not wrong, just older, less complete, less revealed understanding of him. In his gospel, the author of our text, John, quotes Jesus as he places his own existence prior to the invention of time. Thus removing time as the sole meaning behind the word beginning. And then he himself, Jesus, places himself with God, the Father, as part of the Godhead in the beginning. And then he clearly extends the meaning of the word beginning to himself as an identification of himself repeatedly in his revelation to John. First, in chapter 1, verse 8, he uses the terms alpha and omega, first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Then, in 117, he calls himself the first and the last. To ensure we don't miss the point that he's making, 
At the end of his revelation, Jesus first equates the Alpha and the Omega with the beginning of the end in, in chapter 21, verse 6. And finally, in Revelation 22, 13, he puts all of them together, telling John, the revelation of Christ, telling John that he is, literally is, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He isn't just from the beginning, since the beginning, of the beginning. He is the beginning. And in 1 John, the commandment is one that they have had from the beginning, which is with God before the universe was made and before time exists. And which is God, as John writes and his readers read, whenever and wherever that may be, including here and now. Jesus, the Father, the Spirit are omnipresent in both time and space. Time and space do not exist apart from them, apart from him. Time is their creation. They exist before time, and they are not beholden to time as we, as this creature, are. They, he, God, Jesus, is the beginning, and that is where the command comes from. And since they, in them, is the beginning, the end, and everything in between, the command that comes from them, capital T, from him, capital H, comes from the beginning, from the end, from the in-between, from old, from new, from future, verse 8, at the same time. That is awesome. How great is our God? So moving on, kind of. We're still in verse 8. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. True light. This exact phrase is used only twice in the Bible, both times by John. Once here and in the gospel, um, in his gospel, chapter 1, verse 9. Here in verse 8, we see the word true used two times, but they aren't exactly the same word. It's a little weird as an English speaker because uh, we don't have two different words for these. We just, we have the word true. I don't know if this slide is going to work. Um, if it doesn't, I'm going to pretend it does and not look at it. So go ahead. Does it work? Yes. Okay. Sometimes when I try to put Greek up there, it doesn't work. It comes out some weird gibberish like Russian. Um, but it worked. Okay. So the first time it's used here uh, in our verse is Strong's word 227 on the left there, um, alethes. Uh, the second time it's used in conjunction with the word light, it's Strong's word 228, alethinos. Okay, alethinos, accent on the last syllable. All right, the first time John writes that the commandment is true in him and in us is unconcealed, true in fact, it's truthful, it's worthy of credit, meaning it should be considered true absolutely. Okay. The second use in conjunction with light is that darkness, falsehoods, false teachings, truths of sin and of the sin nature are passing away and the true light is already shining. In the New Testament, this form of the adjective true, and they're both always adjectives, so why are they different? I don't know, Greek is cool. Um, they are different. The connotation is different in both Greek and English. And anyway, in the New Testament, this form of the adjective is always used to convey some aspect of God, some word that names, if you will, God, or refers to something in God or from God or of God. Like, for example, uh, the gospel message is the true light that we have here since Jesus is the light of the world and it's the true clarity of who he is. Now, don't try to write all these down. You can find them in any concordance if you look this word up, so 228. Um, I'm just validating what I said. So all of these are from the NASB. Um, 
in Luke 16, 11, the true riches, wealth that doesn't come from the earth, but the true riches in heaven. Uh, John 1, 9, the true light, just talked about it. John 4, 23, the true worshipers who worship the true God with the true um, understanding and don't just go through the motions or actually worshiping. Um, this saying is true, a saying of God, the true bread. He who sent me is true. The Father is true. My judgment is true. So true judgments, righteous judgments. I am the true vine. Um, Israel was fine, now he's the true vine. And the true tabernacle, draw near with a true heart. So there's many, many more examples, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Riches aren't of this world, um, God of God in heaven with him. The true gospel of Christ, not some phony false Gnostic, uh, Serinthian or otherwise gobbledygook. Uh, true worshipers of the true Christ, who is the truth, who aren't, like I said, going through the motions, all that. So just like the old commandment, the light has always been shining. Jesus is the true light, and it's the sun has always been shining. Adam, you would think, had it easiest um, as he walked with God in the garden, probably a theophany of the sun. Um, not my point. If you don't agree with that, we can argue about it some other time. Um, but after the fall, man saw the light, the light coming down from heaven through his conscience, perhaps through dreams and um, through those who spoke to God, like Abraham, way before the prophets, but people just talked to God um, somehow. God then gave Moses the light as revealed in the law, uh, but this was only the light that showed man that we needed the true, the Alicinos light, that came into the world in the incarnation and was finally revealed and fulfilled fully in his death and resurrection. Since that time, since that revelation, since the incarnation, the resurrection, darkness has steadily been passing away as the light, capital L, is already shining in the world. The darkness may appear to be growing because when it seems like the darkness is winning, in reality, it is merely bloating because it is already doomed to die. Just like when darkness fell upon the land as the alleged, as the darkness would call him, son of God, was hanging on the cross. It appeared that the death and the darkness of the world had won. What it didn't know is it was already dead. It made a grave error and did exactly what the true life and the true light had planned. Darkness and death merely sealed their own fate and bloated, swelled up like a deer along the road, right before it bursts. Which if you ever witness, is really gross. First John 2, 9 to 11. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And we've already discussed light and dark. We just sang about it. So I think you can extrapolate the meaning of these parts by now, but I should probably say something about those cute little words there, love and hate. Just understand, biblically, these words are primarily used to convey moral qualities and attitudes, not primarily, although they are involved, not primarily emotions. I can morally hate a sin that you are trapped in without emotionally detaching myself from you. For example, if you have a crippling alcohol addiction, I hate that addiction. I hate what it does to you. I hate how it affects your marriage and your children. And I love you as the image of God and as a brother or sister in need of help. When God hates Saul, which was always something I kind of struggled with, it's because Saul is hope, hopelessly, morally lost. And even if Christ had already been incarnate, Saul would have still rejected him because he had shown that he would not follow the Holy Spirit, which is why David writes, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, because he watched the Holy Spirit leave Saul. Saul would reject the truth shown him by the Spirit. 
He would thus blaspheme the spirit, and that is the unforgivable sin, because anyone who commits it will never accept salvation from Jesus and thus will die unforgiven, because Jesus, God, will not forgive you if you don't ask for it, because he's not forcing you into heaven. You don't want to go. That's your choice. Not where I wanted to focus, though. The part I really hyper-focused on here, a um, little OCD showing, is that word there in italics. It's one word. We've been through that. Sometimes it doesn't look good. It's one word. The Greek word behind the phrase is scandalon, from which we get the English word scandal. Properly, it is the trigger of a trap, the mechanism that closes a trap down on its unsuspecting victim. Figuratively, it's used, particularly in the Bible, but not just, um, to speak of an offense that sets a negative cause and effect relationship into motion. And it stresses the method or the means of the entrapment. In other words, how someone is caught by their own devices. It's like setting a mousetrap and sticking your own finger in it. Okay. How? Through your own personal bias? Through a carnal way of thinking? Through blaming others and not taking ownership of your own bias and your own carnal thinking? Things like that. You set a trap for yourself. What John is showing us, just as last week, we saw that serving and obeying are signs that we've accepted the gift of salvation and thus we are being sanctified, is that hating a brother is a sign that we've not taken on the attributes and characteristics of Christ that are given through the baptism of the Spirit that we receive when we accept the gift of salvation from our Lord. Instead, what we do when we don't forgive, when we don't love our brothers and sisters as Jesus loved them, through literally sacrificing our selfish lives for the good of others, by giving our lives, giving our time to the good of others, what we do is we set a trap for ourselves to be snared by many other types of sin and destructive behaviors. Okay? Off script, but I'll say this again. We're called to love our brothers and sisters, not like them. It's okay to dislike each other. You're still supposed to love each other. Okay. Phew. If you love others, you will not steal from them. If you truly love others, you certainly wouldn't murder them. But those are merely the extremes. Or are they? Jesus says that if you even think of sinning against a person, you have. The sin of slandering a person is akin to the sin of murdering them. Oh, that's extreme. Yeah, Matthew 5, 21 to 22. You've heard it that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Huh. Huh. When I was younger, before I even became a Christian, um, I made the decision to never get drunk. I made that decision because I didn't want to be like everyone else, and I was cheap, and it's expensive. It was not a moral decision. But that decision has kept me out of a lot of trouble. People would say to me, dude, you don't know what you're missing. And they're right, I don't know, and because of that, I don't miss it. I can't fondly look back on times of sinful, drunken debauchery and romantically long for those times, possibly pulling me away from my sin of ser and service to God um, because I don't have times of sinful, drunken debauchery to romanticize and fondly look back on. I might have some other snare from my past but I don't have that one 
And I don't have sins and consequences that stem from times of sinful, drunken debauchery. Do not click the email from the Nigerian prince who needs to get $5 million out of his country. Don't click it. It opens a whole nest of things you don't want. Don't get into a relationship in a chat room with a supermodel who obviously is a cut and paste picture from a fashion magazine because the person is clearly catfishing you. You can't get a supermodel here. You ain't on the chat room either. It's a fat guy in Michigan. <laughs> Don't get involved in a pyramid scheme that will not only bankrupt you, but also three of your closest friends and then three of each of their closest friends. Don't hate your brother and continue walking in darkness, wandering blindly through this world with no one to guide you, stumbling in the darkness with no hope of finding your way, with no light, refusing to simply flip the switch to walk in the true light of Jesus Christ. Here's a fun activity. Go out into the woods with some friends. Find an area that has a good number of trees, but not a lot of underbrush. Now, everyone spread out a good ways from each other. Then each of you put a plastic bucket on your head. Close your eyes, spin around three times without looking down. Now everyone try to find each other, following a few basic rules. One, you have to keep your eyes up and closed. Can't look at your feet. The bucket is just in case you accidentally open them. Two, you can't yell for each other. You have to try to stay quiet. There's going to be some laughing and possibly some mumbling because three, if you decide to move from your spot, you must do so at a full extended sprint. <laughs> if you do somehow find someone, lock arms and sprint together to find someone. Now, how likely are you to stumble during this activity? If you do find someone, how likely are they to be hurting just as much as you are, especially considering you probably just slammed into each other at full speed? Will they help you avoid the trees? Will they keep you from slamming into someone else running at full speed? Now, although this sounds like a great youth game, <laughs> it's probably not a wise way to go about your life. And now you know I am not the youth leader anymore. <laughs> Is that how you're going about your life? Are you walking through this life in the unhindered light of Christ with your eyes wide open? loving your brothers and sisters and helping them walk in that same light? Or are you spending your life sprinting about with your eyes closed and a bucket on your head? Are you walking in the light with your name in the Lord's book of life? Or are you lost in your sin, walking in darkness on his bucket list? Isn't it time to take off the bucket? Isn't it time to open your eyes? Isn't it time to remember the light? To remember what he has done for you? Well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you are our light in this dark world, that you have promised to go where we go and lead us on the path of righteousness, to lead us out of the darkness and into the light of heaven, where you are the light. There's no need for a sun and a moon anymore, because you are there. And Father God, we know that the only reason, the only reason that we have a chance to experience that, that we have a chance for eternal life, is because of you and what you've done. And so we ask you, God, to help us remember, help us to cast off those things that keep us out of the light, that puts the blinders on, and help us to love you more and love our brothers and sisters more each and every day. We thank you, God. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so now we take the time to do just that. We're going to take the time to remember. So if I can get the ushers to come on up here to give me an assist, um, I would appreciate that. Now, this is one of the ordinances of the church. This is one of the commands um, that Jesus gave us, that told us that we are to do to remember him. Here we are practicing an open communion. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are absolutely welcome to take this. Um, if you don't, you can pass it on. Um, no one judges or anything like that. If you don't know who he is, then pass it along. We've mentioned that there are times where maybe we have an unconfessed sin. Maybe we're holding on to something. Maybe we're holding on um, to, to, to hating a brother. You might think of a name right now. It's time to cast that aside. Put that aside. And you can ask the Lord Jesus, you know, I know you died for my sins. I know you died uh, for those things that I've done wrong, for people that I've wronged. I know you've done that. And so um, just take this time, you can confess that, and then freely take of it. But let's pray for the elements right now. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for sending your son, the only one who could pay for our sins. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for taking on that human body, for taking on the flesh that you might save the flesh of all of us. We thank you for what the bread represents, for your body broken for us. We thank you. And Father God, as we do this, help us to concentrate on you. Help us to remember what it is you've done for us. Help us put aside all those other thoughts all those other things, prayers um, for, for others, all those things. Let's just put them aside and let us think of you and what you've done. We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we again thank you. We thank you for going to that cross. And although you took on the life of a man, you then spilled out that life in your blood. And we thank you, Lord, for, for that. We thank you for taking our sins on you for us. We thank you, God, for um, your plan 
We thank you, God, that we don't have to wallow in our sin, that we can follow you, that we can walk in the light. And we thank you, Lord, for this reminder for what, of what you did for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me until I return. And with that, that ends our service today. Just please take your presentation of the covenant and throw it in a trash receptacle on your way out. Save it and make a necklace. Uh, you're dismissed. Thank you.